everybody. My name is Kenneth Reitz, and this is Flasky Goodness, or Why Django Sucks. Now, I'm not actually going to go through and do the traditional Why Django Sucks talk with the uh, big spiel on what things need to change in Django. I'm more of just showing how it might not necessarily be the best tool for every job. And I'm going to show some other tools that might be a good fit for your projects. So uh, my name is Kenneth Reitz. I'm on Twitter at, at Kenneth Reitz, if you'd like to follow me. Um, I work for Heroku which I believe is uh, the best platform to build Python applications today. And uh, I work there because I'm so passionate about products like it. Uh, Heroku's amazing. And I was a big fan of Epio as well before they uh, decided to shut down. But Heroku now, I think, is the best uh, place to be deploying Django applications. And we're hiring, so uh, they sent me out here. So if you wanna are interested in solving really awesome problems, you can check out our jobs page. But in general, you probably know me, if you know who I am, uh, from the open source that I've written. I have uh, quite a few projects that I've worked on. Uh, for example, I have Python Guide, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python. And it's this community website where it's essentially a GitHub repo that you can go and edit. And there's a web public website that's generated from it with Read the Docs. And it serves to document all the best practices of Python in general. Um, it becomes a guidebook for newcomers. And it's a reference for seasoned veterans. And of course, it teaches you to not panic and always carry a towel. It's a, uh, it's a pretty cool project, I think. Essentially, the problem in general with learning Python is that you can actually go and like, if you lock yourself in a basement and try to learn how to write good Python code, like you can write the functional code that works well. But actually knowing like the, the tribal knowledge that comes with being a part of the community, it, that stuff isn't necessarily very well documented. So it's an attempt to, to do so. Um, I authored requests, which is HTTP for humans. And that's a nice um, API for making HTTP requests, essentially. Um, it's a pretty cool project. If you haven't seen it, you can check it out. And if anyone's using it and they want to contribute, please do, because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I've also worked on HTTP bin, which is essentially a testing service for HTTP clients. So it's kind of like a mirror. You make a request to the service. Uh, it will kind of give you a response back as JSON actually describing the request and giving you some metadata. And it has some cool test cases like having a delay and like doing chunked encoding responses and basic authentication and things like that. Um, and I have a couple other projects. There's Legit, uh, Envoy, Tablib, a bunch of them. Uh, there's the OSX GCC installer, which is pretty awesome. It is, it serves to provoke Apple's lawyers. But, uh, not really, they, they're pretty cool with it, but they do call me, so it's fun. Um, so the, the more and more I work on like all these open source projects, I kind of realize that I try to really open source everything that I do, and I find that that really has a lot of benefits. Even if the code that you're gonna write isn't gonna be open source, if you treat it as if it's gonna be written, you know, if it's gonna be published open source, there's a lot of good patterns that kind of emerge from that. So if you're working on an open source project versus some like internal tool that's just being built to get the job done real quick, you uh, usually have like your components of your application become nice and concise and they become decoupled. A lot of your concerns separate themselves from each other. So you're not building code that like is serving only your business need. Essentially you're making a reusable part that you can use in other projects and it'll lead to better code in general. Um, best practices emerge for example, you know, if you're going to be publishing an open source project, that's like, say, a Django application, you're not going to be hard coding a bunch of credentials into the repository you know, for your production instance of it. So if you treat an internal project like it's going to be an open source project, you'll also alleviate yourself from some of those headaches. Um, one of the most important parts is when you're working on an open source project, what, as Django has kind of shown this, uh, extremely well, I think, is that documentation is essentially the most important part of the project, and it counts for internal code as well. So if you treat your project as if it's going to be open source, then you know you have to have really great documentation for it to be really usable, and you have to have tests, and those are things that you should be doing anyway. So it kind of gives you these nice constraints that allow you to build better code. And another side benefit is that if you ever do want to release it, you can because it's already ready. You don't have to go through and like scrub the code of credentials and like do a final check and stuff. It'll be ready to be released at any time, which is awesome. So all of these things, essentially when you're working on these projects, it's all about abstracting things from one another and keeping things simple. 
All right, so you guys are all familiar with open source. You love open source. We're here because of Django, which is an open source project. Um, let's build something with Django, right? Um, there are a lot of benefits of using Django, some very obvious ones. I mean, obviously, most of the people in the room here, I'm sure, are extremely familiar with Django. Actually, I'm curious, has anyone in the room here never used Django before? Not one? One person. Excellent. Just wondering. Okay. So essentially, if you're choosing to use Django on your project, there's a lot of benefits that can kind of arise from using it, and there are things that make it a really, really great tool to build applications. It makes really modular decisions for you. So essentially, if you have a lot of, I guess they're called Django applications, where you have these, you know, these separate applications within your actual process that runs. Um, you know, if you want to have multiple of those, it makes that decision on how to architect those. You have the models.py and the urls.py and such, and it makes those decisions for you. It makes security decisions for you. Um, the, the motto is that it's supposed to be secure enough to run a bank on, and, you know, by default, essentially. So a lot of other frameworks go out of their way, like Rails. They essentially don't recommend best practices by default at all. So like GitHub was exploited, for example, because they have an insecure default in the framework. And Django goes the extra mile to make sure that users that don't necessar aren't necessarily experts in what they're doing can not make really stupid mistakes, which is excellent. Now, the documentation, as I alluded to, is really great. Um, it's, you know, I, I say that it kind of started this revolution in the open source world of having really great documentation. Um, there's a lot of installable third-party Django applications that you can install. So you have things like Sentry that you can just like plop into your instance and then you just have like this great um, error tracking stuff and like all these different third-party modules so you don't have to build a lot of functionality. It's already done, you just plop it in. And the best part is, you know, everyone who's here right now, we're all part of this tremendous community, you know, and we all have, we pull resources and, you know, there's a couple people that build like fantastic libraries that everyone can use and we all benefit from that on both our open source and our private repositories and code, which is just fantastic. Like there's all of these reasons to use Django. It also handles a lot of things for you. So, you know, you start to build your models that you're using to interact with your database and it'll automatically generate an admin for you. It gives you management tools like the uh, command line uh, manage.py stuff. It'll do uh, database schemas and migrations with some simple tools that are provided. Um, you have user profiles, authentication, user sessions and cookies, internationalization, all these things that if you're using another framework, you'd have to figure out yourself and build and architect. These things are all set and there's people who already know how to use them and they can tell you if you're not sure how to use one thing, you just talk to someone and they kind of just show you and it's really great. So, you know, you've chosen to build something with Django, you know, and there's all of this, these benefits. It seems like anything is possible. So, your typical Django application is kind of comprised of three different uh, components, I'll say. You have tools and utility, well, let's start here. We have the web process, which is essentially what responds to HTTP requests. Uh, and it, you know, it handles incoming traffic and it makes the responses and it dispatches everything else that needs to happen. Uh, oftentimes, if you have a more robust setup, you'll have something like Celery set up and you'll be sending some work that shouldn't be done in that web process to a worker process. And then you have tools and utilities. So the tools and utilities include like the management tools, like creating a super user and things like that, and different supporting services. Like for example, if you're using something like Sentry. Uh, you have worker processes, which are like deferred tasks, scheduled tasks. And then you have this web process, which just does all kinds of stuff. It has, it does the user, user interface, it has an API, it does the uh, data persistence layer, the CRUD admin for uh, updating all of your records and that handles all your authentication. It's, uh, it's quite a powerful, it's the, really the meat of what your application is. So having all of these things within a single repository and a single code base can really be quite beneficial. You get all the benefits of running on Django in the first place, and uh, you can figure out like how you wanna architect your application as you go. Like if you think that something should be like in part of this one module, then you can just kind of rip it out and put it into another module that's a separate Django application running under the same process. And it makes it really simple to do these things. You can uh, share modules, you know, so you have like a single module, utility module that's used by all of the different applications inside of your stack. 
and it lets you keep things dry. Uh, and you can make really broad and sweeping changes quickly. For example, if your product is iterating over time, you need to make a lot of like very unexpected or unplanned changes. It makes it really easy to do that. And you only need to deploy your application at one time. The whole thing is just you know one giant blot of code. You push it up, and it runs, and that's it. It's excellent. So as you start to build this application, I've noticed in some of the larger Django projects I've worked on, there's a kind of this trend that seems to emerge often. And you have things like, you know, you have management tools which are generating things that are interacting with your authentication system, and you have supporting services that are also going to be going into the same authentication system, which is going through the ORM, which is going through all this stuff. And you have supporting services that are interacting with your data persistence layer, your user interface obviously uses authentication, the API service. And this, all this stuff starts to happen, where you have like your deferred tasks. Tasks are like writing or running management tools that are like running web processes, and all this crazy stuff can happen. And it gets sometimes, if you're not careful, really out of hand. So I think for a lot of projects, single code bases can be evil. It becomes all of your components become really tightly coupled with one another. If you try to like rip one part out, it like affects every other part of your application. So there's a lot of tribal knowledge that is required to start. Like you know, if you bring a new developer onto the team, or like you find that there's so much code that is so much technical debt that can arise. And it's easy to to do this properly if you really try, but it's really easy to do it improperly as well. Um, iterative change of components can be difficult. Uh, technical debt has a tendency to spread, and you're fo forced to deploy everything at once, which can be a bad thing depending on your application. So anything is possible, but it'll often end up in a monolithic app. So in addition to writing code, I do a lot of other things. Like I enjoy photography quite a bit and um, synthesizers and things like that. And I found more and more like exploring these things that I really like constraints in the tools that I use. I find that they really foster creativity. For example, when you have like, you know, sometimes having to synthesize that it has like three little knobs that you change or four instead of a thousand, you know, it can actually let you focus on the problem at hand, which is actually making music, not doing all these other things. And the same thing with like photography, you can use like prime lenses instead of zoom lenses and it forces you to really, you know, think creatively and actually build good things. So this kind of permeates into the development world too. You have things like text editors, which in general are much more constrained than an IDE. But they, you know, I think most people in the room here probably uses a text editor. And if you've been, and that seems to be the trend in the Python community. And in general, they seem to really help you not, you know, not rely on all these tools that are built into the IDE. And it's a, a nice constraint that allows you to be better at writing code. You're not relying on autocomplete. You know, you can actually build modules that are usable so you don't need it. Um, OSX, for example, you know, there's like not that much you can configure with the user interface uh, unless you actually get work done. I, I have found whenever I was using desktop Linux, I'd just be tweaking it constantly, trying to make it perfect. The same with Vim. I would, uh, I essentially cannot use Vim because I just constantly tweak it. Um, you know, pen and paper versus like some digital system that you can constantly tweak. And this kind of also goes into this, like you have monolithic apps versus like very simple services, which we're gonna get into here. So you gotta keep things separated. So one way that you can architect these applications if you don't wanna have this monolithic app is you have separate web processes, ex essentially, sep separate completely isolated services that can talk to one another. So here's one model that's pretty popular. Essentially, you have two different types of users that are gonna be interacting with your application. You have developers and also machines, and then you have end users. So the end users interact with your front end, and then you can have developers or machines that start to interact with this API service that the front end also talks to, and then that's what handles all your data and all this stuff. Like the, uh, all the things that were smashed kind of into this web process before become separated. So for example, if you wanted to swap out your data persistence layer, you know, switch your databases, or something like that, it, it's of no concern to your front end because it's just consuming a service. So just like if we built open source, if we build our code as if it was gonna be open source, there's all these benefits that arise. When you start to build your code for services, a lot of these other benefits start to arise. Again, your components can become concise and decoupled from one another. Your concerns separate themselves. 
a lot of best practices emerge. So you have like, you'll use the right tool for the job. You don't even have to use Python if something's better and there's something built that actually suits the job better. Um, documentations and uh, like API contracts essentially become really crucial. You know, you cannot be consuming an API that doesn't have documentation. You shouldn't be at least. You know. So, you know, having all these things that you should have anyway become impertinent to the functionality of your application. Um, services can be scaled separately at any time and dog food is delicious. So with this, there's composability. So, you know, before we had the front end, end users, we have the developers, and those are two API services. We can have both of these services talk to, say, another API service, which is like our true back end that has like the super user credentials that can do whatever it wants. And you can have that actually have the API layer. You have like this internal API, essentially. And then, you know, you can have like your, some like common message queue that you have set up that everything can talk to and send jobs to and workers that all talk to this common web service. And you get this very elegant pattern of keeping everything nice and abstract. So if someone's working on some crazy thing for the front end that like, I don't know, requires some weird library that isn't compatible with something that you're doing, like it's of totally no concern to the rest of your application. Your authentication and your actual like user credentials are completely separate from your front end, which is separate from your developers and everything like that. It's a pretty cool pattern to do, and I, I find it like really helps me approach applications in a, in a really nice way for the way I like to, to personally work. Uh, it definitely doesn't work for a lot of projects. You know, there's all those benefits of Django that do exist, so that it's not necessarily, I don't think every app in the world should be written this way, but um, you know, as you start to build like larger applications, it it's, becomes more and more um, apparent that building for services can be really quite beneficial. So, you know, we know Django. Let's try to build an application in this service model with Django, because that's our web framework, and there's no reason it can't be used to do this. Uh, there's this uh, joke from the Web Summit at PyCon last year, it was that Django it just sits there, because it's a module. Anyway. Um, so, Again, there's two basic components that we're gonna be building in this application that's written in Django. It's gonna have an API service and a front-end client. And again, the front-end client, which is essentially the user-facing website, interacts with this API service that actually provides all the business logic, the authentication, and like the data interface to the database. And then the front-end does the user interface, like sessions and state, and it's like the public-facing version of the website. So if we are using Django for API services and nothing else, and find that there's a lot of things that just aren't, don't really make a lot of sense. Um, Django just doesn't seem to be a good tool for the job. You have a lot of like significant boilerplate code that needs to be built to do really simple views. Um, you know, you're not, if you're building an API, you don't really need like template and template tags and all these things that are like some of the core features of Django. Um, some of the API libraries can be kind of buggy. Um, obviously that's improving every day. Um, and then you have to do things like if you want to have a, like a very RESTful API that you're building manually, like you can have to do like if request.method equals post and there's no like good like method dispatch type of system. So like it can be really easy and you can, uh, you can build tools like this, but it's like not the most um, pleasant ways to do it. And you know, it, it kind of permeates throughout the whole thing. Like if you're not using the ORM, like let's say you have a Django application that is just consuming another API, you find that like you know, a lot of things are different about Django that you, you wouldn't expect. Um, so if you're using Django purely as an API consumer like that, uh, you know, the database isn't handled by your application anymore, it's handled by another application that you're offsetting to. Um, you know, Django is making those modular decisions for you again, and uh, it, again, it like deals with the database and you don't need to deal with the database anymore. So you find that all these applications that people install you know, that you like this third party applications that you start to b bind into your application that make it very useful to use Django. They're all really tightly coupled to the ORM. And um, third party Django apps that you want to consume are as well. And like the user model requires sessions and it's not extremely flexible. So you can, uh, there's just a lot of things that you kind of start to run into that become difficult. So. Uh, you know, when you get to this point, it's kind of like, what is left of Django once you remove the ORM and like you're not using templates? And like, essentially what's left is you have like regular expression routing and 
you know, a fairly inefficient templating language. So there's this awesome library that I think is really great and I want to show it to all of you that can be really good for building services like this and it's called Flask. Flask is a web framework that is based on Wurzug, which is by uh, Armin Roenacker. It is uh, it's a really, really simple way to, it's a simple library that allows you to just essentially ex receive incoming HTTP and then send out external HTTP to respond. It's really great for building web services. It's really simple and elegant. So like to set up, a, you know, this is a fully functional web application here. You just import Flask and you give it like an app instance, which is kind of like the, uh, the global context manager in a way. And then you just attach a route to it. And the route is a function that's returning a string called hello world. And then, you know, if you want to use the development server, you can just tell it to run and it just works. It's very simple. You don't have to like have all these different files and do regular expression routing to, uh, you know, with the urls.py and stuff like that. Um, if you're fam really familiar with Django, there are some similarities with Flask. It's a whiskey application framework, just like Django. It has a uh, built-in templating system, as Django does. In this case, it's Jinja2, which is considered by many people to be one of the best templating languages around. It uh, has an active community, and there's extensions for quite a bit of things. Not nearly as large as the Django community, but there are definitely tools that uh, in like pre-built modules that will help you get things done. So some background on Flask is it was actually started as an April Fool's joke. It was quite awesome. There was a, essentially, so it, there's a really popular framework for Ruby called Sinatra, and it's really famous for just being like this one file that you just drop in and it just works. And then, uh, so Flask was actually called Denied originally, and it was essentially like this, it was released on April Fool's Day but no, no one really realized that it was a joke. So like, it, it was like number one on Hacker News all day. And uh, it, was, it was pretty hilarious actually. So if you actually looked at the code, essentially what it was is uh, like, it was like 20 lines of like just code that doesn't appear to be doing anything. And then it looks like it's empty. But then if you actually like scroll to the right at the very bottom line, there's like this entire like, I think a hundred some K of this base 64 encoded uh, zip file that contains the actual code that's being run. It's, it's pretty awesome that it works. But essentially what it was is Armin always joked around that, uh, um, you know, Wurgzug, which is like this great, this generic WSGI library, utility library, you could build really powerful frameworks with it. But he didn't, he didn't really see a lot of people doing that. So in doing his joke, like it had documentation and the ex code examples looked very similar to what Flask is now. You know, and it got so popular, he, he realized that um, essentially the best way to get people to use Wurgzug in a framework-like manner is to actually just provide them with something that is pre-built and works because people aren't going to take the time to build it themselves. So if you make it very simple and generic, and it, it has a lot of traction. So Flask itself is actually extremely simple. Uh, there's about 800 lines of code in the code base and 15,000 lines of tests. Everything that isn't in those 800 lines of code is, you know, all inside of Wurgzug, which is just this library that is a utility belt for, Wurg for uh, WSGI applications. It's extensively documented. There's 200 full printed pages of documentation. And it has a very layered API, so if you like, ever want to break out of what Flask is doing, you can just respond in pure WSGI or at the Wurgzug level, and everything is uh, pretty flexible. Some differences with Django is that it, it's very explicit and like passable application objects. So you can have a single process that actually has like seven application objects that talk to each other if you want to. I don't know you, why you'd want to do that, but you can, which is pretty awesome. It's really good for testing. So you can actually like spawn a new instance of your application, make changes to it and test against it and then do multiples of those in the same like within a function if you wanted to. Um, it has a really simple and elegant API and there's like no boilerplate code at all. Um, it, I call it BYOB, which is bring your own batteries. Essentially, all you get is like templating and you know responding to HTTP requests and routing. It doesn't do anything else. Like there's no forms built in. Like it'll it'll parse the um, form encoded data into a dictionary, but it doesn't do like any form validation. There are really good extensions for that, but Flask itself doesn't contain any of that. Um, there's no built-in ORM either. So usually people use SQL Alchemy. There's a great extension for it, but 
Flask itself, you know, it's, it's for crafting responses that has nothing to do with the a database in any way. So if you wanted to build something that's dispatching things to another API, you know, it's the exact same as using a database, essentially. And it has context locals. Instead of passing in, so in Django, when you have a, a view, essentially you pass in a request as like the first parameter, a request object, and in Flask, it uses context locals. So you just you like import request at the module level, and then when it's run, it is the request when you're actually in the function. It's a little, that's kind of the weirdest part about it, but it, it helps keep things clean when you're doing more advanced things with extensions. So it's, I think it was a good decision, but if you're coming from Django, that'll be one of the biggest things that seems odd to you. So some improvements over Django, in my opinion, is that you know, Flask comes with almost no batteries, and that really allows you to be really flexible. You find when you're working with Django, you know, essentially every, if you're using a lot of like third party applications with Django, you'll find that they all use all the included batteries, and if you want to replace one of those batteries, uh, it can be extremely difficult. Uh, you know, some people like end up forking Django and there's like these monstrosities of code that end up in the end. So if you don't have those batteries in the first place, there's nothing to replace. Um, Jinja 2 is considered, again, one of the most, uh, you know, incredible templating systems around. It's very, very efficient. And uh, I don't know anyone who's ever spoken badly of it. And uh, I know quite a few people who've spoken badly of the Django one. So I don't really know a lot about parsing and such, but I know that it's pretty good. Um, Everything harnesses actual references. So like in Django, when you have multiple applications, and I, I know this is um, better recently, I think in 1.4, but you know, in, in general, like if you want to install a Django application, you like add a string to the settings file, and you have to do these, these weird import things, or it's doing these weird import things for you. And then in, you know, in Flask, essentially, if you're using separate applications within the same process, you're actually just using the regular Python import system. There's no like, weird thing that's going on there that's making that happen. Um, configuration is just a simple dictionary. It's not like this lazily evaluated module with uh, all these parameters that are kind of like changing at runtime. I don't really understand the Django settings, uh, the back end on how that actually functions, but I know I've been very frustrated by it many, many times. And like the Flask one is literally just a dictionary, so it makes things very simple. Um, now, one of the biggest things that people run into when they're starting to approach Flask, the first thing they say is that it's really, really hard to build, you know, large applications with Flask, and people hold that as a candle against it. Um, essentially, my pitch is that that's true. You can build large applications with it if you want, but you're going to have to build all of those modular decisions that Jenga makes for you. You're going to have to go through, and you're going to have to, you know, actually figure out how you want your application structure to be and how the imports work, and you're going to have a lot of circular references, circular import issues that you need to figure out. Um, but if you just avoid writing monolithic applications in the first place, and you write web services, where these separate code bases are doing these separate things, that is never a problem. And if you e were to accidentally start building an application that is larger than it should be, Flask makes it so you know, it, it's a nice constraint. It actually forces you to do things in a more proper way, unless you're going to take the time, invest the time to actually develop like a, a system that works well for you. Um, another cool thing about Flask is that all the response objects are WSGI applications themselves, so you can do a lot of cool things. Like if you have another WSGI application, you can just like return it as a function or vice versa. It's uh, it's pretty cool. So, um, some other really great improvements is the Wurzug debugger is extremely powerful. It's really cool. If you're in debug mode and you have an exception, you have an interactive interpreter in the web browser that you can just type in and like introspect all your objects, and it's really awesome. Um, there's no import time side effects, so you don't have uh, a lot of besides the context locals. But there's you know in Django there's a lot of application or a lot of things that you'll import and they have a lot of weird side effects sometimes. Um, signal system. It has, but it's not attached to the ORM in any way, which is really great. I know that a lot of people, from what I understand, don't like the Django signal system because it's tied to the ORM. People often make bad decisions with it, from what I understand. They uh, have a tendency to like, they'll do a query in it, essentially, and it'll like, every request they ever make will run this query and it'll really slow things down. So if it's not attached to the ORM in the first place, uh, you don't have that issue. Um, tests are a lot simpler to run when you have real app objects. And uh, has a cool little thing you can do. So if you just return a tuple with the content, like the if you have a binary string that is the body, and then you 
you know, tuple with the uh, status code, it'll just generate it. You don't have to import the re response object and generate it, which is pretty awesome. Um, if you're using it, there's some really popular extensions that might be of interest to you. There's Flask SQL Alchemy, and SQL Alchemy is considered by many people to be one of the most advanced um, forms in the world. It's very, very powerful and flexible. It is way over my head for a lot of the things it does, but it has a model layer just like you know, the Django ORM. It's very similar. Um, making the transition from A to B is pretty simple. It has a lot of cool things like uh, connection pooling, for example, is built right in, and uh, it's really nice. There's Flask Celery that you can use as a concurrency framework or for delaying jobs. It's very similar to Celery's Django support. There's Flask Script, which gives you management commands. Essentially, it allows you to um, have a manage.py file like in your project that you can use for creating users and the same things that you would do in your Django applications. And there's a really cool one called uh, Flask WTF, which is the WTF form library for form validations. And essentially, it lets you do like the Django form. Oh, it's, it's different, but you know, it's the same basic idea where you can do form validation pretty easily. So uh, I have a shameless plug as well. These are the extensions that I've made for Flask. There's a Flask SSLify, which is an SSL library. It'll automatically redirect you to the HTTPS version of your website. It sets the HSTS um, security headers. So it's like, it kind of locks things down. Um, there's a Google Federated Auth plugin that allows you to just say, you know, my domain is, my, my Google domain is this, and then it, any incoming request to your application will get, it'll, it, essentially your application won't respond unless you have logged in with that Google account. It does the, uh, what's it called, open ID through Google, which is pretty nice. So like, you know, when we build an internal Heroku app, essentially we just flag it to all Heroku email addresses. So if anyone's logging in with another account, it doesn't work, it's pretty awesome. Um, Flask Heroku, I wrote, which is like an environment variable configuration system. So like we have a lot of add-ons that set environment variables. So if you have a database, it's like a database underscore URL. So this will automatically take that and put it into where the SQL Alchemy is expecting, essentially. So if you're gonna be using Flask, just keep in mind that it is a sharp tool for building sharp web services, and you should be using the right tool for the job. If you're torn, on Flask versus Django, on alcohol versus ponies. Remember, you can always use both. Services are agnostic. All you need to do is use HTTP. Any questions? So we have about five minutes left for questions. So I have an example for you for uh, why we'd want to run two apps in one process. Think about something like the Django admin app. Plug it on in there, introspect stuff. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you? I'm sorry. Uh, an example of another app you'd want to co-locate in a Python process would be something like the Django admin app. Plug it in, introspect. Yes, absolutely. That would be, that's a great example of why that would be really awesome. And I, I guess Django prevents you from doing that because of the settings environment variable, I believe. Is that, I think that's what's preventing that? I don't know if it really stops you. You just have to figure out how to URL pie it in, maybe push something down a level and get everything yeah. to not fight with each other. It'll, I guess there's, there's work to be done, I guess, right? So I had a question for you. So, yes. uh, you know, you're advocating using sockets everywhere, make everything a service, make it all loosely coupled. And, and I can understand the independent scaling. I can certainly understand if you had a language barrier, some Java here, some Python here, it's the only way to go. Uh, but it makes me nervous whenever, whenever somebody brings that up because I'm thinking, you know, every time I add a socket, that's something that can break. That's a machine that can go down, a process that can't be there. When I make a call on a Python process, if I'm making that call, I know the thing I'm calling is gonna be there, assuming my, you know, yeah. Git checkout didn't break. So just why? Yeah, well, why, <laughs> why so many sockets? How, well, do you, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> well, I said, well, you have to test for these things, you know, it's like any application, instead of having a single point of failure, you can have many, uh, which is definitely a downside of building applications this way, but um, I mean, that just comes with the territory, I guess. I don't really have a good response for that. <laughs> just accept it for big uh, apps, I guess. You, you, I think you, you have to have really exhaustive testing and, you know, like graceful failovers and things like that, I think is really the answer to, to that. But if you have a single app, you know, uh, all those components are still there. They're just, you know, you have full ownership and control over them, right? Like, it either all works or it fails catastrophically and is easy to detect. Yeah, exactly. So there's definitely ups and downs. Uh, I, I guess I, my question or 
comment was going to kind of piggyback on that. But um, uh, there's the, the, the whole fallacies of distributed systems or, you know, it's a, uh, I think it's a Sun paper from long ago about, you know, the issues that um, as, soon, as soon as you're distributing systems, you're now counting on your network and, you know, your network may have, band, you know, not have guaranteed bandwidth or, yeah. you know, there's security issues and, you know, when you're, as soon as you're bringing the network in, it's, you know, this whole other piece. So I, th I think that's like a, another trade-off to consider when you're, you're building systems distributed. No, oh, absolutely. There's yeah. like, there's always ups and downs, but I, th I think most of the people in the, in the room probably like 90%, 99% probably don't have, aren't going to be limited by network bandwidth, I assume. Like I know I, none of the applications I build are affected by that, but if you're, you know, something that's really high availability, I can definitely be an issue. Do, do you find like, uh, I mean, uh, maybe not, but, but there's like latency involved, right? You know, uh, between stuff that you wouldn't have if you're making. Yeah, there, well, it depends on how you, how you architect it. But yeah, there's always, if the more hops you have, obviously the, the more latency there will be, but it can also have a lot of improvements too. So if you're using HTTP, you know, you can just use HTTP caching, you know, to be caching database calls instead of doing like, well, you know, these more like ORM level things, you can kind of make them more at the HTTP level because the browser handles it pretty well. So if you make your applications handle it the same way, like 